Good morning. Good morning. I am back. <laughs> I missed you guys. Quite a journey. Um, I am glad to be back today, and my husband is here in the back. <laughs> he did your coffee today since Tom was out, so um, we thank you so much, you guys, for your prayers. We really felt them. It was, it was a vacation like no other, but like we said, it wasn't the one we planned, but it's the one that God planned, and we trust in that, and like I said, trust that we did what he had us there to do. It was great to minister to some of the people over there, but we are also glad to be back and just continue to pray for the people over there. They've got a long haul. The people in Lahaina not only lost their home, a lot of them, their cars burned up, and a lot of their jobs are gone because they worked in Lahaina. So they've got quite, quite a long run ahead of them. So normally I would come back with some really fun vacation pictures for you, and we don't really have any. But the day after the fire, the Lord provided this. It was simply beautiful. You wouldn't even have known there was a fire. So that was the day after the fire, and he gave us just a great sunset, and we're so excited. So I just want to say welcome to the new people. If you're looking for Pastor Jeff today, he is not here. He is there. <laughs> he is vacationing with his family. He's over in Spokane in Idaho, and he said he is just having a great time. He will be back next week. Doesn't that just look like him? <laughs> But we have um, Dave Ladd is with us today, and he's going to come up and share with, you, share with us in a little bit. So if you are new, um, we just want you to know we have a great time of Bible teaching, snacks in the back, we have great fellowship, and we just want to welcome you. We're so glad you're here. So we're going to do, guess what? Jeff gave me cards. I want to know who can do the whole Psalm 23. Can anybody do the whole thing? Oh, okay, hold on. I can, but I don't want to do it. I want someone else to do it. All right, Linda, I'm coming. New King James Version, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yay! Psalm 23. <laughs> Which one? Woods. There Which you go. Whoops. Wow, that's impressive, the new King James. Okay, so here's your morning table talk question. Um, if you guys ever look online, there are a million national days. There's like seven, eight, nine national days, and one of today's national days is Chop Suey Day. So talk amongst yourselves, what's one of your like favorite Asian dishes? Are you like a chicken fried rice person? Are you a General Toes chicken person? So talk about that for a few minutes and I'll ask. Okay, what are you guys talking about? I have to say mine is probably chicken fried rice, but like with prawns in it. I like chicken, prawns, and a whole bunch of stuff. What else? I heard pod thai up here. What else? Oh, almond fried chicken, goza. Anybody in the back, rowdy table, do you not eat Asian food? What? Oh, wonton soup. Yakisoba. Okay. Anybody else? All right, we're going to have Kim come up, and she's going to share our prayer requests. Thank you. 
Oh, it's so good to be back here. I got lots of hugs when I got here today. That was so exciting. I brought treats, but they didn't last long. Sorry for those of you who didn't get any. <laughs> so, <laughs> good morning. Please silence your cell phone so no one's interrupted today, especially Dave when he's speaking. That would be wonderful. Uh, I would like to welcome um, uh, Kelly, uh, Ken, and Polly Peterson. They are new here today, um, and they're trying to be permanently here today, but they have a house. They're trying to sell in Montana, and they got a house here. And so as soon as they can get rid of that house in Montana, don't any of you buy it, because then you'd have to leave. But uh, if you know anybody in Montana. <clears throat> anyway, welcome. Welcome, Ken and Polly. So I have a uh, praise request. Uh, Clyde Green is here and doing well. He is now... he now has a shiny new pacemaker and praise the great doctors. So, yay. Bob Hadeen, no job yet. Keep praying for God to open up just the right job door soon. I am still waiting to hear back from several companies uh, regarding in-person job interviews. So please keep praying for uh, Bob Hadeen. Uh, Sue and Ken Short, a prayer for our friends who are in the path of the Hurricane Ida. I, and I think that's in Florida. Idalia, sorry. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on, but I have them somewhere. Oh, here they are. Oh, this will help. Uh, Sandy Parnell uh, has a prayer request. Her platelets took a, a nose dive and went from 151 to 77. Please pray that they don't go below 50, which would mean another infusion. Thank you. So we'll keep uh, Sandy in our prayers. Pam Risto, please pray for our daughter's job situation. She is under a lot of stress and has many decisions to make. So let's keep her in her prayers and hope she finds a job. Um, this is from me. Um, please pray for my daughter, Misty. She has... A rare case of mastoidus in the mastoid bone uh, behind her left ear. She goes in for surgery Thursday morning, and they will either be able to drain the infection off the bone, or they're going to have to remove the bone completely. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's this bone right here behind your ear. So the bone itself is infected. So please keep her in her prayers. <clears throat> This is from Susie. Uh, please continue to pray for Maui. Uh, they find, and may they find peace in the Lord. Also continue to pray for Ray Strap. The stones will need to take three sessions to remove, and the surgeon felt the surgery was too dangerous. So we'll keep praying that the um, electrodes work. This is from Rodney LaFritz. Pray for Tammy Stokey, who is suffering from headaches and sight problems. She is recovering from her eye surgery and, um, that she had last week. Also praise Connie is almost completely healed of her back pain. And thank you for your prayers. Uh, this is from Brandy. Please, please pray for healing of back pain. Uh, travel safety to visit her family in Alaska. Ooh, I want to go with you, Brandy. And this is from Kirsten Shaw. My appointment last Tuesday went well. I felt calm during the entire three hours, and I know it was the prayers that being said for me. I will have in surgery in the next four weeks. Play, please pray that my insurance will um, quickly approve uh, the nuclear medicine and plastic surgery that is needed to complete the su successful surgery. Also, praise daughter Heidi has been having some issues with her heart lately heart lately. She saw a cardiologist and everything is good. He told her that the symptoms are likely her fibromyalgia and the family is thankful for this report. So with that being said, <laughs> uh, good morning and I've asked um, Phil Lang to come up and pray for us today and then Dave will be up here to give us a great message. Thank you. And do silence your cell phones, all of them. Love you. Love you most. Let's pray. Oh, sovereign Lord, we thank you so much that you are above all, that you are the creator, not only of the world, but of the universe. We thank you that you are sovereign in the affairs of Hawaii, this horrible fire that was so destructive 
We do pray for the people there that were affected. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work in mighty ways, <clears throat> both miraculous and through the kindness of your people. Thank you that we as a church could have a part in that as well <clears throat> and as individuals. Lord, we pray for our many maladies. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, but they do wear out by the time we're their age, this age. And Lord, we pray for the many <clears throat> requests, you heard them all, and you are sovereign and you are the great healer, so we ask that you would step in and heal uh, miraculously in uh, case after case. We thank you that we can bring our requests to, to you. We thank you that you answer prayer and uh, that you receive our prayers with um, your blessing. So we pray for the rest of our time together, that it may honor and glorify you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All to Bella and Gertie. Good morning, you can go ahead and get to your feet. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bella. I'm kind of new here on staff and don't know everybody yet, and so I'll, I'll introduce myself for the next few times, but I'm excited because I get to spend a lot more time with you guys this fall. Um, so yeah, um, before we get started, I just kind of want to share a little bit about what's been on my heart. Um, the theme has just kind of been trusting and surrendering to the Lord over and over and over again, and um, <clears throat> some kind of heavy stuff is going on, some big changes in my life, like I'm sure everybody's life, because no matter if you're old or young, there's always big stuff, um, and the Lord's just kind of been showing me that I need to keep on surrendering. It's not just a one-time thing you do, but it's an over and over and over and again thing. But um, kind of the hope in this, kind of what has been in my mind is a, or what came to mind was a passage, Luke 9, 23, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know, which says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take upon his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And kind of the reality of this is yes, the Lord asks us to die to ourselves, which means dying to the world, but the greatest thing ever is we get life in Christ with that. And um, that's been so comforting to me in a time of just, I don't know what's gonna happen next and I need to re-surrender. Trust the Lord, because when I think I can do it and I think I'm doing great, the Lord's like, no, you still need me. But that's a good thing, because I got you and you're safe in my hands. So as we just worship, I invite you to think about that. It's something that I've really needed. And um, as followers of Jesus, we all need that sweet reminder. So just sing with me. Um, you make it easy to love you.
blessed assurance Jesus is mine And he's been my force man in the fire Time after time Born of his spirit Washed in his He did for me on Calvary is more than so we see. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior.
we love you. Thank you for this time to worship you. Thank you for this time to be reminded that we need you and that we need to surrender our lives to you daily and that we are in constant need of you. But that's such a sweet reality because you are exactly enough. You are exactly what we need and you will always satisfy and you will always be there, Lord. We just love you and I just pray that our takeaway today can be that you are trustworthy and that we, that we need to surrender to you, Lord. I pray that you are honored by this time of worship. And I thank you, always. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Dave Ladd today to speak for Jeff. Well, first, uh, we need to get a couple of things straight. Uh, Lisa, I was noticing at the beginning when you were handing out cards and you were asking about Psalm 23, uh, I don't know who the gal was that so well quoted Psalm 23, but I noticed, I looked around, and there were a lot of other people mouthing Psalm 23. They didn't raise their hands when you asked who could quote Psalm 23. So uh, don't be shy. Um, another thing is that Lisa also shared with you that Jeff was out of town and that I was um, substituting for him. And that's just code for uh, if you don't like what you hear today, come back next week because it's going to be completely, <laughs> completely different. Um, Jeff and I go way, way, way back uh, in high school. And one of the things that we roomed together in college and... Um, I can't lean on this too hard. It'll fall over into the um, orchestra pit. Um, but anyway, we roomed together in college, and we went on, when we were in high school, our senior year, we went on a, a choir tour down to California, went to Anaheim, and when we were at uh, Disneyland, we bought uh, hats, because we always thought of ourselves as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And so we bought these hats that were in the movie, and uh, he was always Butch Cassidy and I was Sundance Kid because he was always more of the joker and I was a little bit more of the serious one. And so uh, I had to keep him in line, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you can quote me on that because he probably wouldn't, he wouldn't disagree. He would probably agree with that. Um, I have a dad joke for you before I begin because uh, there's a lot of dads and a lot of granddads in here, so you, you don't have to shout it out, because then you'll ruin the punchline, and I want to say the punchline. Because it's, I, li I heard this not too long ago, but anyway, what do you call a hen that stares at lettuce? A hen that stares at lettuce. A chicken sees a salad. That's a, that's a good one, isn't it? My 11-year-old 11, my 11 grandson loved it. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that one. <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay, okay. I have no PowerPoint today. I, I, I apologize for that, but then I kind of, I don't apologize for that because I think about the early church, and they didn't have PowerPoint. I know, and I, I thought, how could... How did Paul do it if he didn't have a whiteboard and a marker, you know, kind of thing? How did, he, how did he accomplish what he wanted to accomplish? Well, so today we have you and me and the Holy Spirit and this book. And that's probably all we need for now, right? So uh, I just want to let you know that and warn you. And uh, I guess maybe no apology is necessary. I want to pray before um, I really get into this. Uh, we have, I have a lot of ground to cover, um, so I'm going to be, I'll probably be speaking in gusts up to 50 and 60 miles per hour uh, because, because there's some things that I want to address based on the text that, that uh, apparently you're in now from where Jeff left us. So let's pray. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable to you in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's my understanding that uh, Jeff's been teaching through the Gospel of John, 
and he is uh, towards the end of chapter 18, at least that was the text that he told me, so I hope I'm in the right place. Jesus has just been arrested and been uh, taken to, to Pilate. The Jews wanted Jesus dead, and so they brought him to the Roman governor of Judea, basically the prefect. Pilate poses, we're in, and it's, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to John 18. And it's, we're going to begin in verse 28 and then move uh, further into chapter 19. And then in the, in the halfway through this, I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to segue uh, because we're going to talk about truth and then we're going to talk a little bit about falsehood and then kind of bring it together. Pilate poses the question to the mob, what's the accusation against this man? Because he must be thinking, why are the Jews bringing this guy to me? Listen to their answer in verse 30. They answered, he said, what accusation do you bring against this man in verse 29? And they answered and said to him, this is absolutely ridiculous and ludicrous answer, if this man were not an evildoer, he, we would not have delivered him to you. Well, let's just throw logic and rational thinking out the window, which actually seems to be the order of the day among a lot of people. How about instead of Jesus being evil, perhaps there's corruption in the ranks of the Jewish leadership. How about that one? Is that a possibility? Well, Pilate wasn't interested in, in, in said, just you deal with it yourselves. You, you judge him yourselves. Just judge him according to your law. And they said, well, we can't do that because Jews were not allowed to exercise capital punishment. Only the Romans could. And so, and they said as much to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death, which fulfilled, it says, the word that Jesus spoke, signifying what kind of death. Because Roman capital punishment was by crucifixion, and it was horrific. Well, Pilate moves into the praetorium, which was his residence, the governor's residence, and has Jesus summoned, and he asks him, kind of the beginning of a question and answer with Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response is classic. He flips it back, which he often did. He flips it back on Pilate and says, um, is that coming from you or is that what you've heard about me from others? And Pilate goes, do I look like a Jew to you? Say, immediately on the defensive. It's your people who have delivered you to me. So what have you done? In verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. It's not from here. So, Pilate says, you are a king. Because he'd mentioned a kingdom. And it's kind of one of those, one of those half questions, half statement kind of things. You, don't, you kind of don't get the how is he asking that? Uh, what meaning is behind it? It's hard to say. You kind of, you think you're a king maybe, or you are a king, or you are a king, or you are a king. We don't get the tone. I wish I would have been there. I, I would have loved to have heard this conversation between Jesus and Pilate, but there's no missing Jesus' response. Basically, he says, you said it. You said it. You say that I am a king. That was true. That was a truth statement. He said, for this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now that was a mouthful. And then Pilate then asked his famous, what is truth? And I, and I think, I really think that that was kind of almost off the cuff as he was turning to go back out to the mob because there, we really don't have anything, and we don't have a response. It's just kind of like Jesus says, um, uh, 
uh, my kingdom. And he says, you're a king. And Jesus says, yeah, you said I'm a king. For this I've been born. And everyone who hears the truth, uh, is the truth, hears my voice. It's almost as if Peter, Pilate's going, what is truth? As he walks out. What is truth? He was a postmodern ahead of his time. It's almost as if, not as if, he goes out seeing Jesus is innocent. He goes back out to the mob and straight up says to the Jews, I find no guilt in him. That was a truth statement. There was no guilt in him. And in a matter of hours, the guiltless will be taking upon himself the sins of the guilty. The full and final sacrifice as the unblemished lamb of God as atonement for humanity's sins would occur, providing the way to God for those who would receive the truth about Christ, who would receive the truth who is Christ. From there, we have Barabbas released, also fulfillment of prophecy, Pilate has Jesus scourged in the preparation and torture leading up to crucifixion, including Pilate begin to, beginning to crumble under the pressure of the mob. Although, he makes some latch ditch efforts to release him. In verse four, Pilate comes out again and says to them, after Jesus has kind of been beat up, he says, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. That's the second time he said that. And so Jesus comes out wearing the crown of thorns and the, and the robe, and Pilate says, behold, the man. So when the chief priests and officers saw that, they went crazy and just started screaming, crucify, crucify. And Pilate says, you take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Three times. The Jews answered him and said, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he himself made himself out to be the son of God. That's blasphemy. So when Pilate heard that, he backed up. And he goes, I, I don't want to deal with this, this group. I don't want to get entangled in Jewish law whatsoever. And so he went back into the praetorium again and says to Jesus, where are you from? This time Jesus doesn't even answer him. And Pilate says to him, oh, you don't want to talk to me? Do you know what kind of authority I have? I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you. And Jesus, as if to say, time out, mm -mm. you have no authority that hasn't been given to you from above. And for this reason, he said, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So some of the things that Jesus was saying kind of made sense to Pilate which made him think that this guy is not guilty of anything. He's innocent. But what didn't make sense to Pilate was why the Jews were bringing him to kill him. So he's kind of scratching his head over that. And it said he made more efforts in verse 12 to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, and cried out, they kept crying out and kept crying out, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And Pilate says, that's it. Because now they're appealing to the authority of Rome, and that is Pilate's wheelhouse. He was put in Judea by Rome. And so when he heard those words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews... Behold, your king. That was a truth statement from Pilate. I don't know if he meant it or not, but what he said was true. So they cried out, away with him. Away with him. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king and the chief priests? The chief priests said, we have no king but Caesar. In that exchange between Jesus and Pilate, while there's a, there was a lot of actually truth in what was said, even out of Pilate's mouth, whether he knew it or not, the scenario is also packed with lies. 
from the very motivation of why Jesus was there in the first place to every subsequent decision of the mob moving toward, interestingly enough, a God-ordained conclusion. We see the truth. We hear the truth. And the truth was nailed to a tree. And in the midst of the truth, there is swirling falsehood. And so, I'm here before you, I can't say that this is going to necessarily be a feel-good message, because I want us to see, us, I want us to see the, the importance of truth, and I also want us to see the subtle nefariousness of falsehood. And so those aren't like yuck, yuck subjects. I may not be invited back, but I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Given the stage of life where we are in, right? If you're under 55, you're not supposed to be in here, right? But that's okay. You can stay. You can stay if you are. What do we need to be telling our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren? What are we to be teaching them? And I think some of the things that even are in John 18 and 19 are pertinent to our influence on the next generation and the next. Truth is foundational to God because he is truth. Truth is foundational to understanding reality, not fantasy, by definition of the word. Something that is true means it is in accordance to reality. Accurate, exact. In the theological context, we might say absolute. <laughs> it distinguishes between what is real and what is false, what is not real. It distinguishes itself from what is not true or what is false. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And the culmination of Jesus' serving that was unique to him was that he would give his life a ransom for many. We're given clear understanding about who Jesus was and what he came to do, and that's what he's talking about when he's speaking to Pilate here. His very reason for coming, vital to God's plan of redemption through Jesus, was the testimony of Jesus, the testimony that was Jesus. For this I have been born, and for this I came into the world to testify, to give witness to the truth. The truth about the gospel, the truth about himself, the truth about if you've seen him, you've seen the Father, the truth that if you receive Jesus, God gives you the right to become his child, the truth that in him is abundant life, both qualitatively and quantitatively, eternal life. The truth that he died for our sins and the truth about the fact that death was conquered and the truth that there is a hope of resurrection because he was raised from the dead. The truth that there is only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, and the truth that there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The testimony of Jesus by his own admission is truth that doesn't come from the world. The world didn't make this truth. The world doesn't shape or change the truth. It is the truth along with the way and the life, John 14, 6. Not, not a truth for me and a different truth for you. There's no such thing as your truth and my truth, particularly if they're diametrically opposed. That doesn't make any sense. Either one is right and one is wrong or they're both wrong. He is the truth for all of us, unchanging, even using that loaded word in society, absolute, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In a world of moral and intellectual relativism, Jesus is the anchor for our souls. 
the rock upon which a wise man builds his life because everything else is sinking sand. All the talk about truth is because there is so much at stake in Jesus' claim about truth, his reason for being born, because our posture, our position, and then our subsequent action on what we believe about him being the truth or not being the truth is a matter of eternal life and death. And so Paul comes along later in Ephesians. By the way, if you want an understanding, both theologically and practically, of the church, read the book of Ephesians. It's great. He comes along in Ephesians 4.15 and says, we are to speak the truth in love to one another. And that's one of the principal means of growing up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Why is falsehood so anathema with God? Proverbs 6.16 identifies lying along with six other evils as an abomination to God. That means it's at the deep end of bad, of wickedness. God hates falsehood. God hates lying. He hates deception in any form. I... <laughs> I heard a lady say not too long ago, nobody in here. <laughs> heard a lady say long, a, a, a little a while ago, I don't know how long ago, because time flies ever since COVID happened. It's like, it was just yesterday. No, it was like three years ago. Um, I heard her say, you know, sometimes you just have to fudge a little. And I didn't say anything, but I thought, fudge a little? Fudge? What does that even mean? You know, or someone said, well, it was just a little white lie. What is that? It's like, what, is it like witches? You got black witches and white witches? You got black lies and white lies? What? I always thought lying was lying. No matter how big or how small. We're called to be holy, <laughs> set apart, different, because he is holy, 1 Peter 1.16 which means I assume that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. I don't think that's difficult to understand. I think my 11-year-old grandson can understand that actually. The Bible is heavy with testimony against lying, deception, and falsehood. Lie, my, my mom always used to say, lying lips are an abomination of the Lord. She also used to say, and I told you this before, spare the rod and spoil the child. I thought, Mom, come on. Did you know that a lying lips are an abomination of the Lord is in the Bible? It's in Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Not only does it say it in chapter 6, it says it in chapter 12, and really all the way through. But the second half of that verse says, and those who deal truthfully are his delight. Isn't that good? Proverbs 21.6 says, the acquisition of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor, the pursuit of death. In Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, John writes Jesus' words, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, it's not a matter of indifference to God whether we tell the truth or not. In fact, there is kind of a connection between the practice of lying and the condition of the heart that causes the biblical writers to believe and write, pretty assuredly, that those who consistently practice lying in their lives are outside of Christ. Truth is a sobering subject. <coughs> See, sometimes we say the truth hurts, and it does. But wounds of a friend scour away evil. It's like light. It's like love. Because it's part of God's character, his very being. In Colossians 3, Paul posts a list of deeds that we're to consider being dead to they're identified with the old man, the old self, the person who's outside of Christ. Verse nine, don't lie to one another 
since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. In Ephesians 4.25, put away falsehood. And as you study Ephesians and Colossians, we find that we are commanded to put off the behavior of the old man since we're new in Christ and to put on his character since we've been clothed with Christ to kind of slip Galatians 3.27 in there. In Colossians 1, 5, and 6, Paul identifies the gospel of Jesus Christ as the word of truth. And so I'm here to tell you, some of you have been Christian, uh, Christians a lot longer than I have, but no matter how old we are, never, we never stop learning, do we? We never stop growing. We never reach it. Even Paul said, I haven't arrived yet. I haven't attained it, but I press on. That's true for all of us. There's things we can learn. There's things that we can renew. There's things that we can rededicate to. And maybe the truth is one of those things. It certainly is something that we need to pass on to the next generation. Jesus identifies Satan as the father of lies in John 8, 44. He lied to Adam and Eve, and then he got Adam and Eve to lie to God, and he's been at it ever since. And so to put it simply, lying is self-serving. Truth-telling is God-glorifying. And so let me segue into Acts 5, where we have a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. How many know the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Okay. Uh, quite a few of you do. They lied. They lied. They sold a piece of property for such and such a price and held back some of the profit, which was not, there's nothing wrong with that. There was nothing wrong with that but they brought the remainder of the proceeds and laid it at the apostles' feet like a lot of other people in the church were doing and gave the impression that they had given all the proceeds, all the profit from their sale and had laid it at the apostles' feet. And from our vantage point, we look at that and we would recognize that they shouldn't have done that. I mean, that was wrong. I mean, they were fudging a little, Right? They both were struck down for lying to the Holy Spirit, to God, thinking that they could get away with their hypocrisy. And so lying and deception and falsehood or whatever synonym you want to put in there really boil down to a foolish selfishness. In some form or another, de deception is to fulfill a person's own desires. That's why excuses and rationalizations are made to justify, but 99% of the time, deception is self-serving. So I want to give some rapid-fire forms of, of deception, spiritual deception, what it looks like, that hopefully would be helpful in giving direction to the next generations in living ethically and honorably before God, to walk in truth, His truth. Number one is deception or lying is nothing more than partnering with the devil. In verse three, let me read down through verse three from verse one, Acts five, this is Ananias and Sapphira. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? It's a dangerous thing to be in cahoots with the devil, the enemy. In fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, our struggle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against powers that we don't see. It's world forces of darkness. It's spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. When we lie, we're sleeping with the enemy. Let's just call it what it is. Secondly, deception is looking like something we are not or trying to not look like something that we are. And that's Verse 4, Peter says to Ananias, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, wasn't it still under your control? I mean, you could have done with the proceeds what you wanted to do. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Well, they had lied to men, but what really mattered is they lied to God. They tried to pretend to do something that they didn't do. It's kind of like smoke and mirrors. You know, look at this over here while we're doing something over here. 
pretending to be someone they really weren't. It's the temptation to look more spiritual than we really are. Jesus had some strong words for that hypocrisy in Matthew 6. And what is striking in this story is no one ever said they had to give all the profit. <laughs> there was no command. There was no, no law written that everybody had to sell property or houses and give all the money. By the way, therein, we know that the scripture is not advocating socialism. It's not advocating a government-enforced acquisition of assets to be redistributed. That's not what was going on in the early church. It was a generous graciousness that was being demonstrated in light of the great grace of God among them. They saw a need and they were meeting it. It was the lying, the deception that grieved God. Thirdly, deception is deadly. Listen to verse 5. And as he heard uh, these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it, I should say. Verse 10, uh, Sapphira wasn't there. She came in later. And so when she came in, <laughs> Peter said, same thing that happened to your husband is going to happen to you. And verse 10, immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. If you've, be if you've ever been there in deception, you will know what I'm talking about. When I say that deception perpetuates wrongdoing because it breeds lies. It breeds secrets. It breeds hypocrisy. When a person is doing what is right, there's no need to lie. No fear of scrutiny. There's no need to hold our cards close to our chest. I always told my children, if you are doing the right thing, you don't have to keep looking over your shoulder to see if someone's watching you. You know, just turn the spotlight on. Let it shine. That's what light does. That's what Jesus, Jesus was authentic and genuine through and through to the core. And so this incident with Ananias and Sapphira is pretty dramatic. And seeing the outcome we might be inclined to say, well, um, I, don't, I don't think I'd ever do anything like that. Oh, really? Really? Do you ever make decisions that although they are not illegal, are just this side of ethical because you think it's no big deal? It's not going to hurt anyone else. No one will ever know, or everybody else is doing it. You know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. We hear it from our kids. Maybe we've said it before. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the check is in the mail. Is it? Or back in the day when we had the rotary phones and your, your children would race you to the phone to pick it up first, and then they pick it up, and you realize it's someone wanting to talk to you, but you really don't want to talk to them. You go, tell them I'm not home. <laughs> you know? But weren't you? Or just stuff the candy and pop into your pockets, and once the movie starts, it's really dark in here, no one will see. Besides, here's the rationalization, they charge way too much for snacks in the theater. I refuse to be gouged like that. See, and, and they're, all, they're, they're kind of funny to us because I think part of the strategy of the enemy is to make sin comical. Because if we're, la if we're laughing at the antics of the drunk or if we're laughing at the, at the uh, uh, comatoseness of the drug addict, it almost creates a numbness to sin in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds taking the temptation of fudging just a little, it's not so hard to fudge the next time because it breeds. Well, leads to one more. Deception always sees itself as less serious than it really is. Ananias had no idea. They had no idea in verses one and two, the verse five and verse 10 were coming. And it's hard 
It's hard for us. The hard part, but so critical, is that they, they didn't do anything that was too bad. So in people's eyes, there was a little compromise, of course. Obviously, some marginalizing of the truth, but, but what real harm did they do? To use a politically correct word, it was only a little misstatement of what happened. Didn't hurt anybody. Sheesh, wasn't that a little harsh? We look at this and say, what was so bad that God struck them dead? And by the way, this is in the New Testament. It's under the new covenant, the covenant that we're under, the covenant that will exist until Jesus comes back. So be careful, little lips, what you say. (laughs) Be careful, little mind, what you connive. What they did may not seem like a big deal, Any sin a person really wants to do, they want to make less of it than it really is. But obviously, it was a huge deal to God because all sin, any sin, put Jesus on the cross. To the one who is truth, lying is an outrage. It's a huge deal. Every time we try to run things, every time we try to control things, we only need to point to the cross to see how huge a deal it really is to God. Just a couple more things. Are you still with me? Okay. I mean, I, you're looking good. You're looking, you're looking marvelous. <laughs> so. First, God takes his business. What did I miss? What did I miss? What? You look marvelous? I can't see you real well, so I believe it. It's from my heart. <laughs> Truly, you do. I mean, just honestly, when I seeing every time I've been asked to speak, um, I've been here a couple times before, and uh, and then once when Jeff was speaking, and I always wa- I kind of watch him online because they put Encore online on the on the website. It's thrilling. It truly is. I mean, to see, it, you're the church within the church. Do you realize that? You know? You have such an important role in this body, even though it may not feel like it, even though you may not think it. The influence and the impact that you have on the next generations, even though sometimes, you know, like a, a middle schooler will sit back with their arms going up. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm not listening. You know? And then, they, and then they come in the next week. You're in a Bible study or in a Sunday school class or whatever. And you come in the next week and you start reviewing. And then that person who looked bored out of their gourd begins to repeat everything that you said. And you go, oh my. See? They're watching us. They take cues from us. We have impact. We have influence whether we realize it or not. How many people have been saved and remember, it was my grandma who kept praying for me. See? Well, anyway, a couple things. First, God takes his business very serious, and I wasn't lying. I wasn't even fudging just a little bit. He takes his business very seriously, and God takes what we say and what we do very seriously. If we were to paraphrase this whole story in one line, and you're probably thinking, well, why didn't you do that in the first place? We would have been out of here by now. But if we were to summarize it in one line, it might be, it's pretty wise advice to always tell the truth. No kidding, really? Do you ever wonder why some things are in the Bible, some things we will never know until heaven? This is one of those incidents where it's easy to ask, Why is this even here? I'll tell you why I think it's here. Because we're lied to all the time. It's a bombardment of falsehood out there. If you watch the news, and it doesn't doesn't matter what news you watch, I have my preferences just like you do. I have my preference just like you do. It's so confusing. And in the last, in the last 10 or 20 years, I don't, I don't know if you've realized that, man, I've realized it is how skeptical people have become to know whether what's being 
shared is even real with the photoshopping and the video editing and the AIing and all of that stuff. It's like, it's confusing. I have a hard enough time negotiating my iPhone. <laughs> I hand it off to my grandkids, fix it for me, man. I need help. He goes, you do need help. It's hard to tell what is even real anymore. In some cases, because almost every, if not every advertising campaign you see has some form of falsehood in it, or uh, very comical, or just plain rank false advertising, but it's there. It's interesting to me that the Holy Spirit is described as the spirit of truth because it is the spirit of Christ. And I pray that in all of our lives, truth will increase and grow, that we might be candid with each other as members of Christ's body and straightforward and just plain, frank, open, real, unaffected, accurate, truthful, honest, of course, respectful and kind and gentle because that is fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. But let's walk in the light as he is in the light in every ministry meeting, in every Bible study, every small group. Let's be open and above board and straight up in our dealings. No pretending, no fudging. <laughs> because as Christ's body, our eyes need to be open. We must be wide awake to the fact that God is not humored by lies. Everything boils down to the most basic elements of glorifying God, worshiping him, worshiping and following Jesus as Savior and Lord, building up one another, sharing the truth and the grace of his love with those who don't know him yet. Several years ago, I read the story of a, a pastor whose young son uh, had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. I mean, it was bad. It was rampant. And the doctor had just shared the news with the father. And the father thought, how, how am I going to tell this to my son? How am I going to explain? I'm, I don't know what to, I don't know what to say. I mean, he was just burdened. And so he wrestled with that and, and eventually found himself walking down the hospital hall because the, the, it, the time was short. And he went into his son's bedroom and, and took his hand and he had told him what the doctor had told him and that it may be only a matter of weeks, maybe even days. And so he read a scripture and he prayed with his son. And after the prayer, he said to his son, buddy, are you afraid to meet Jesus? I mean, the, the boy had, had accepted Christ as his Lord. He'd made a confession of faith. He knew who Jesus was, and the father was assured that he would be in, in glory with, with Jesus. But he said to him, buddy, are you, are you afraid to meet Jesus? And that, that just pre-adolescent son looked up at him, kind of blinking back the tears, and he said, no, not if he's anything like you, Dad. What a testimony. If we're serious about this for our own lives and for the lives of the next generation and the next and the next, the lives that are in our care, may we join the chorus and repeat with Joshua, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God takes it seriously when we call ourselves his church because he wants us to look like his church. He wants us to look like his son's bride, you see. He wants us to resemble the fact that we are in his family and that that family likeness can be seen to the degree that people would say, oh, I can see you belong to that family. Oh, your father is such a man of his word and fulfills his promises. You look so much like your father and older brother. A greater compliment could not be paid to the children of God. To this purpose I was born. To this purpose I came to the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice.
Dave, thank you so much for bringing the word today. We are so blessed that you were able to fight all the traffic from Arlington to get here. So, wow, crazy. Okay, um, we have a few announcements today. Rachel's on her way down. She can sign you up for the veterans breakfast. On the table over there where Rachel's gonna be, actually by my husband right now, there's also some um, half sheets for a grandparenting conference that's gonna be at Snohomish Christian Church. So if you have any interest in that, you can pick up a flyer for that. Um, next week, Jeff will be back, and we will have some... <laughs> Just for that, Dave, you have to come back and listen to him. Um, and we will have some uh, global partners here with us that we'll be sharing. Um, at the end of the service, we will have some prayer time up here. And I'm going to ask our prayer partners to scoot to this side of the stage today. Because if you are going to the Aqua Sox game, I need you to gather up here. We have some things we need to discuss. So if you're going to the Aqua Sox, as these people exit their tables, grab their seats. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers Doris Glover, Garrett, um, but she passed away, and her service is going to be on September 15th at 11. If you would like to come, it'll be in the Student Center, and Dell Enzi's Memorial is the 23rd at 11 o'clock, and it will be over here in the Student Center as well. So we've got a few memorials going on. So, Dave, do you want to come back up and close this in prayer? That's okay. I'll let you use this. Again, thank you. Thank you for uh, your graciousness and um, having the opportunity. It's always fun to talk about the Word of God and how we can be more like Jesus. I really believe that. And so uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence here. Uh, Bible says it only takes two or three, but uh, wow, what a crowd. And, and there are so many here who love you and uh, who follow you, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it does light our path, guides our feet, guides our thinking. Give us the boldness uh, through your spirit to be the kind of men and women that you've called us to be, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. To have a desire and a passion to know Jesus more and more. And thank you for the blessing that you are in our life and the opportunities that we have to praise you, whether it's through music or whether it's through uh, study, whether it's through your creation, the evidence of you is all around us. Help us to be that city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And when men and women see the church, that they will glorify you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>